Ali Coleman. I am the executive director of the Hurston Wright Foundation. And in case you didn't know, the Hurston Wright Foundation's mission is to provide services, supports, and opportunities that mentor, recognize, and provide community for professional and aspiring black writers. Workshops and classes are taught by award-winning authors serving emerging and mid-career adult writers. And that's fantastic. I, I've been with the Hurston Wright Foundation since December 2021. And I would say that the majority of my career has been really, um, I've worked at universities, um, community organizations, and a lot of the work is always centered on the youth. And we love the youth, but I love working for an organization where uh, the predominant amount of work that we do really um, caters and, and takes in consideration that we are always, we are perennial, we are ongoing learners and really yes. has a focus on black writers, black adult writers, um, providing opportunity, services, and support. So I'm very happy that you're here today. Um, more than a thousand black writers have taken our classes since the first one in 1996, even though the organization was started in 1990, co-founded by um, writer Marita Golden and bibliophile Clyde McElveen, um, two DC, um, based or um, natives, I, and I like to stress that I was born and raised, in, in, I was born in Washington, D.C., raised in D.C. and surrounding areas. Um, so it's really important that we know that it's an organization for black writers, founded by black writers, and a black reader. Um, more than a thousand black writers have taken our classes, increasing the diversity in the cultural community as they have gone on to create books and careers as professors, local cultural workers, and national thought leaders. So through a social justice lens, our work provides the necessary services, supports, and opportunities for black writers seeking to publish work within a publishing industry that has traditionally failed to publish work by black writers proportionate to our population. We also recognize that our social activism aids in disrupting systems that hinder black writers from having access to certain opportunities, from writing residencies to participating in quality writing workshops and craft talks. By a show of hands, how many of you here today are writers? You identify as a writer. <coughs> All right. So I, 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 I'm expecting everyone's hand to raise when I say how many of you are readers? Yes. So, <laughs> so we are so happy. So currently, I just want to um, let you know that Hurston Wright, we currently have virtual professional development courses for writers taking place as right now we are in the midst of our spring semester of courses and right now our submission portal is open for you to apply to a summer writing workshop with an award winning writer. We actually have 10 writing workshops that are taking place this summer from um, poetry and fiction writing to nonfiction writing, um, sc um, screenwriting and playwriting. And one of the things that I'm really excited about is that this summer, um, Anyone know this woman named Zora Neale Hurston? Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, her niece, Lucy Ann Hurston, who herself is a socio sociologist, will be teaching with us this summer. She's doing a research writing, a research methods um, course for writers. So those of you who are writing um, non historical nonfiction or historical fiction, and you're looking for ways to engage in your research to prepare for your, your book, um, she will be doing a, um, she will be doing a, um, a week-long workshop. She will actually be teaching three days of the week-long workshop, and two days will be taught by our writing, manor, writing programs manager, DeAndrea Johnson. Um, so um, if you're looking for a nurturing environment where you can refine your writing voice, develop your craft, be part of a writing community while gaining industry insight, and look no further. So that's our house housekeeping. I have to do our plug yeah. um, and let you know who we are. You know, 
give, give some credibility as to why you're showing up today. And so I wanted you to, um, you can always learn more about us at hurstandwright.org. But I want to um, welcome you to today's event, um, Poetry as Liberation. This event is presented in honor of National Poetry Month as we explore how poetry as a form of transformative language arts can be used for liberation. And just to give you some context, transformative language arts is an emerging field that recognizes the individual and collective liberation through practices such as writing, storytelling, theater, spoken word, poetry, and music. It recognizes that these art forms can work towards community building, cultural and ecological restoration, and personal development. I am a scholar and I, you know, I got a doctor and all that, but we don't be calling spoken word poetry, you know, transformative language arts. You didn't come here for that. <laughs> you came here to learn how spoken word and poetry is used for liberation. So let's, let's talk about that. So um, we rarely think about poets and spoken word. Well, I'm not gonna say we, because I know that um, as artists, we are healers um, and that our work can be healing and can also be destructive. Um, it is what we choose to use it at for. Um, but many times people do not think of us as liberation workers. Um, but liberating is often what our poets and spoken word artists are doing when they present their art. So um, during one lecture she gave in Berlin, the late renowned poet Audre Lorde said to her students that she is, quote, committed to poetry, not only as an art, but as a way of life, end quote. Lorde said that, it is, quote, through poetry that we give names to those ideas that are until the poem is written nameless and formless, all right, end quote. So liberation is the act of setting someone free from imprisonment, um, slavery, or oppression. It is release. So today we are gonna talk about poetry as liberation. So I'd like to um, introduce to you um, our panelists. We have with us today, on the far, my far left, we have C. Alexandria Bernard Thomas. A queen, yes! C. Bernard Thomas, Alexandria Bernard Thomas is a queer, black, non-binary, award-winning poet, teaching artist, an advocate for child abuse prevention, the LGBTQIA community, and mental health awareness. C leads the popular discussion-based writer's workshop, Writing to Wellness, which is trademarked because it has that TM, yes. okay? <laughs> that uses poetry as a tool for healing when navigating childhood trauma with creative, with the organization Creative um, Suitland Arts Center and HERD, okay? Their work as a community organizer has afforded them opportunities to educate adults on how to respond and react to child sexual abuse through darkness to light stewards of children and becoming a board member for Touch Me, I'm Telling. Mm -hmm. All right, let's give it up again for C. Alexander. All right, so all of y'all in the back, I know y'all see this, this circle. We want you to come on in a circle. We want you to close. All right, so next I'm going to introduce to you Kaniki Jakarta, whose name means great writer. Kaniki is the inaugural poet in residence for Northern Virginia Fine Arts Association. She is an award-winning performance poet who has toured the U.S. and the U.K. Kaniki is the first Black Poet Laureate of Alexandria, Virginia. Yay! A 2022 Academy of American Poet Laureate Fellow and the author of three novels, two poetry collections, a memoir, a short story, and a poetry collection. Let's give it up for wow. the <laughs> So, um, I think even before we get into conversation, wouldn't you like to hear some poetry from these folks? Yes. 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 So, so you all have the option. Um, I would like you to, to read from here, just so the folks that are watching us can can see you. But we have a lectern there as well. I'm short, so even if I stand up, I'm scooting over. If you want to stand, I know you like to stand. Sometimes I want to sit. You want to sit? Sometimes I want to sit. You sit. You do your thing. No, 
of those things I want to say. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so you're going to kick it off. I am. I have to take the glasses off, though. That's tradition. Wait a minute. Before you start, can I stand up? Cool, because I want to see if I was going to still be in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we love our brave and challenged people. <laughs> And let them know you are a son, God born, center of the universe put in place by the hands of the majestic blaze across the morning sky, you are the one. Life everlasting, tracing clouds bright, be it sunrise or sunset, silver linings bow to its maker. You exist to scorch the hearts of those who have tried to forget you. They know you, have called you name, try turning you into dusk. They forget beauty comes in the morning. Light claims everything it touches rise always. Show them how you bend shadows into shapes. You are fearless. As powerful as rays of mother, as tough as the core of your father, burn with the reminder that you are as bold as any infernal formed against you. Fire fights fire, ignite with triumph the dawning of a new smile, you the glowing gospel leading flocks to the promised land, little wonder, anointed treasure, kindling kindred, joy made melanin be great, and let them know you are a son, God born, radiant and destined to be, luminous child, darkness will not hold you. When a toddler stands for the first time, an audience assembles, a cheering section emerges, hope urges a first step. Hands reach towards her in case she needs help. We all know that she can do it. So we wait and we anticipate the steps she will take, the ones that will give her the cognizance and confidence to walk in her walk. And when she falls, she's met with applause, hands extended, encouraging her to begin again, telling her to begin again, because life is a walk. And we're all willing to talk her through it with a little bit of encouragement. But when an adult stands for the first time, an audience of naysayers assembled. No hands extended, only fingers pointed in the wrong direction. No compassion, no affection, but life is a walk. And some people are afraid to get lost in the steps of the past. See, sometimes we have to make our own path. Nothing leading the way but determination and hope. Walking a tight rope of the unexpected, swallowing rejections like a horse pill. But you can't stand still, not if you want to live, not if you're willing to make a life for a living. Not if you're willing to take a chance on yourself. See, sometimes you have to encourage yourself. See, sometimes there'll be no one there to help you but you. Sometimes you have to be your own leader, your own cheerleader, your own boss, whatever it costs. Sometimes you have to go broke to be enriched, to be whole, to mold yourself into yourself and with God's help, anything, you know, everything is possible. Creases expelled from the fold. Every day is a moment of clarity for the melanated folk, either waiting for your reasoning to reject our humanity or witnessing yet another death by your hands of souls wrapped in brown skin, again and again the repetition like drum beats, beating, beating into our minds that we are not valued. Throw away preciousness only to be spotlighted under the looking glass of scientific inquiry, to be copied and conjoled, adorned prettily for corporate consumption. We have explained and hashtagged our bodies to request, beg, and plead for the empathy and solidarity as humans to no avail. Failing, failing, failed. Maybe if we were dogs, it would be easier, I think. Would be heard and treated justly in less than a blink. Would save our necks from the proverbial leash we get to move freely up about, up and down the streets. 
Parks would be made just for us to gather and convene. Y'all would love us in all our varied sizes and shapes and textures in between. Y'all would pick it and both boycott to save and protect our skin. If we had four legs or were the animals you treat us like, maybe we could begin to win. Maybe freedom for us would begin. Maybe we would not be judged by our skin. Maybe we would not have to face police brutality again. Maybe we could start pro stop protesting. Maybe we could stop marching. Maybe, 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 maybe it's pretty awful that a dog's life is more stellar than being a human, black, brown, red, or high yellow. Maybe it's pretty terrible that after all the horror you inflict, all you see is a need to extinguish the lives of people who just want to be free. Maybe it is high time folks stop trying to appeal to your conscience and realize your resistance is by design. You know who we are. You know we are human. You know we are worthy of respect. But pushing past all your years of indoctrination that has shaped your belief that you are better is something you cannot so easily forget. You were promised superiority, but every day you're confronted by the fact that you were told a lie. So in your place of work or whatever place you have power to assert, you go and give it a try. Like wrinkles that are resistant to the straightening of the heat. Every day a victory for you revolves around our defeat, always trying to feel complete. There is a lot to say about those who only feel tall when others are on their knees. The feeling you get there is something you ain't never going to appease. This back and forth is going to haunt us until you come to grips that we are here. We are here, becoming more self-aware, more unified, stronger, and more bold. Forever wrinkling your plans of dominion, no longer creases expelled from the fold. This is getting pretty old. A wall can't be built to make this right for you. What you got broken inside is generational for you. This mediocrity you're confronting is what is hurting you. This failure to face the truth is what is hurting you. This false reality you keep trying to make real is what is lying to you. Wake up! Your dreams are hurting us all. being part of an arts um, group called Liberated Muse Arts Group, and I just want to give a shout out to one of my um, company members, Coley Aziza, who's in, in the audience today. Um, and that piece is actually something that we could perform together as a group. Um, so I want to thank you all. Thank you for sharing and, and beginning um, this conversation when we talk about liberation, um, because I, I love the dynamic of um, all of our messages coming from these different angles, but really intersecting. Um, and I would love to for for C. Alexandria uh, Bernard to start with sharing um, what was this inspiration for the piece that you shared with us, and even when we begin to talk about this idea of liberation, what that means for you. The piece that I began off with is called a, it's called a it's called an amber in, in the sky a poem for Tezzy. Tezzy is a child, and I'm very good friends with his mother. He's a twin, and he's also autistic. I have a brother who is autistic. Tezzy is very, very smart. He is 13 years old, and this child can already type 200 words a minute. Mm -hmm. And what? yes, he types 200 words a minute at 13. Wow. And no mistakes. Wow. <laughs> Straight A student, and he picks up everything like that. Mm. One day, I was over at the house. We were in the kitchen, and I, where every time I went over to Jessica's house, we would always cook. So this one particular time, it was just Tezzy and I in the kitchen cooking. And he said he wanted a grilled cheese, and I said, "Well, do you know how to fix one?" And he said, "No." I said, "Well, guess what? I'm gonna show you because you're old enough now to learn how to cook for yourself at a certain age. So you know, let's go ahead and cook you a little grilled cheese. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through the steps, and you're gonna do it yourself, okay?" And so I walked through the steps, he did it himself. I said, now make me one. And I, did, I just stepped back and he did it verbatim the way I taught him with no problem. And that moment, we bonded. Mm -hmm. So the following day, his mother called me and she says, Tessie said he was hungry. And he said that I'm, I'm gonna fix a grilled cheese because Chris taught me how to fix one, and so now I'll never be hungry because he taught me how to oh, fix wow. food for myself. Oh, wow. 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 
and it made me cry. It really did. It made me cry a little bit. And so when that, I just got the thing. I said, "This is a very bright kid, and he does not know, or he probably already knows that he's going to be faced with so much because he's autistic." And Jessica, out of the two, she's very protective, more so over him than she is with Corey. But she still doesn't want to coddle him, but she's still protective, if that makes sense. Yes. Yes. And so I just wrote the poem. The first line to the poem that came to me was, you know, raise a mother. It's his mother, always shining down on him. But then from there, the rest of the poem just, just started to come to me. And I wrote that poem, so when I finished writing it, I called her to share with her, and she instantly began crying. And she said, you just don't know how hard it was today for me going out with him in public because people were looking at him and I knew he was gonna say something. And it took everything in me not to say anything back. And she said, and she said, thank you for being one of those loving people in my child's life. I know he is safe with you and I know he's gonna be protected. I know he's gonna be loved by you. So that's the story behind an Amber in the Sky. Amber in the Sky. I love that. And what a, what a perfect example of what I open with, um, how poetry gives shape to the nameless and the formless. Yeah. And so you're able to express, and in sharing that with her, you know, you gave validation to her experience of mothering a child who um, is overcoming autism. Um, yeah. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. It's not easy, and I know it isn't easy. Like I said, I had a brother who was autistic. And he was much older than I was, but <clears throat> knowing what my mother was going through with him mm -hmm. and how much she, and my mother also was sick at the time while she was dealing with him. Mm -hmm. So I have a very soft spot yeah. <laughs> for autistic, right. for autistic yeah. people, not just kids, but people. Because right. right. they're often overlooked, made fun of, discarded, even sometimes put in a group home because people don't know how to deal with them. Mm -hmm. right. And it's just, I just say learn to appreciate the difference and the beauty within them because they can teach you so much about yourself. Mm -hmm. And he's also working on three languages. <laughs> so, oh, wow. I, I love yes. that. I love that. How it's all, I love that extreme and that hyper focus and that. I love that. I love that. Um, same question. Well, I the title of the piece is called Walking. And I found it in the, the beginning part when I talk about the toddler. I found it in a book, like I, I had typed, typed it up and it was stuck in one of my journals. It was unfinished. So I had no idea where I was going. But at the time, I was going through something, right? And I don't know if you've ever heard the uh, saying, but let me just say for anybody here, the saying is, if you're going through hell, keep going, mm -hmm. right? So at the time I was going through some hell. So, and sometimes when you are in a situation where no one, you're looking for, as an adult, you're looking for someone to relate. Like when you're younger, you're more looking for like an ear, right? You know, the supportive, I'm calling my friends and I'm saying I'm going through this. When you are going through a hell, you want somebody that's already been through the hell. To tell, so they, they are the example that you can make it through, right? And they can tell you what they went through and you're relating with that person. But sometimes, there is no one, right? So that's why I said sometimes you have to encourage yourself, right? Sometimes there'll be no one to help you but you, right? Because like in life, right, you're not gonna always have someone to say this is the direction you need to go to. Sometimes you gotta make your own paths, right? And if you got a God, then you better pray. Because if you wanna make life for a living, as I wrote in there, you wanna make life for a living, because this, this life, if you haven't lived, if you're not living right now, you're just doing the same, repetitive, repetitive. Mm -hmm. I just made a post that said, it's your life. Are you the driver or the passenger? Mm. Yeah. Right? So you really got to think about it. Are you living somebody else's dream or are you trying to make your dream come true? Right? Mm -hmm. So if you're not living right, if not in, in your life, let this be your message for you. If you're doing something that you don't want to do, stop. Make a plan and get out and live your life. Because you only got one. Yeah, you true. only got one, and it belongs to you. So yeah, so that was the and I and I called it walking because everybody got a different walk. Mm -hmm. You know, a life, mm -hmm. life is a walk. So, so in in your response, you 
informed us that the act of writing the, the poem was catharsis for you because you were going through something, mm -hmm. but it also sounds like it was an element of the intent being to motivate other people once they hear you share it. And so my question is to both of you, do you write, where, where is the balance um, between writing for yourself and writing for your audience when we think of liberation? Is it, you know, because when I think of liberation, um, and when I also think of writing for the audience, sometimes you can be so tethered to what you think people expect from you or want to hear that it's not really liberating because it's, mm -hmm. you're writing for other people, not yourself. So how do you find that balance between writing, as you share, you know, you're going through something that's helped you, but also knowing that this is something that your audience needs to hear? Mm -hmm. I will say I'm always writing for myself first. Okay, and I want you to speak louder so those okay. watching can hear. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, I write first and foremost for myself, and then everyone else is a benefit for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I say for myself because even with the poem I just shared, it still started with an emotion yeah. from within me, for me to make sense of something that I was feeling based off of what was shared with me and for what I experienced. That was a shared moment, yes, between his mother and I, but it was more so my emotion that fed that, that, fed that feeling for the both of us. So I always thought there, the balance, I would say, could come in because making sense of both sides and wanting to do both sides justice. And how can I take those words, those metaphors, those verbs, those similes, and actually bend both of those things and to take those emotions and manipulate them into what it is that we are both feeling. But I always start out for myself, every writer, I. It's, I think it's safe to say we always start it for ourselves. It's not with whatever we're feeling. It's never based off of what someone else feels, even though their feeling may have prompted it, but it's based off what it shook in us, what it stirred in us. And we have to take what we're feeling to make sense of it, and then they also get the benefit from it. I write for me, but it's not for me, if that makes sense. Break it down. Okay. <laughs> so, I'll give you an example. I wrote a poem. I was uh, contracted to write a poem about HIV. And I wrote a poem from a perspective of uh, a woman who was born with it, right? Like she, she got it because her mother had it, whatever. So, I'm thinking I'm writing a fiction piece. And after everybody left, this young lady comes to me and says, that's my story. So you were channeling, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so what I have learned in all of these years of writing poetry, I've been performing poetry. I, I performed poetry when I was a little girl, but then I started again in, in 2020. So, and I'm 14 years old. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I have learned from experience that even my experience is not my own, right? So I'm gonna, when I'm performing a piece, or writing for me, right, writing for me, but when I perform it, so it's for somebody else, right? Because my gift is not for me, it's for everyone else, right? Now, the, the liberation of it all is about talking about it, because don't you feel better when you talk about it, if you got somebody, right? So it's just like that with poetry, when, you, when you're up there and you're releasing it, you know, some poems that you write, you don't have to do them anymore, right? Because yeah. I have some poems I wrote about him, I love him, he don't love me. I don't love him enough, right? So I have to do that for him anymore, right? So it's over. It's over, right? It's in the book, though. It's in the book. But over, right? You see the faces of yeah. 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 So the, the liberation part is getting it, getting it up and out, right? Sometimes you want to write to inspire. Now, however, there is a balance for me because I've been at, like, being poet laureate, and you get contracted, so you have to, you know, do poems. Since you're not writing from you, you're writing for a particular right. or something, right? right? You're right. writing for some history right. and you're contracted to do things, right? right? So it might not be my feeling, but it's the history, which is for me because I learned it and then for everybody else because I'm teaching. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so interesting um, that everything that you've said, both of you, um, resonates with me as a, a writer, but also as a parent, um, particularly the piece where you said, 
Don't you feel better when you bite out? How many people here remember when they were little little girls or, or boys or um, trying to figure out who you are right. and you have that journal and you writing it, someone just says something to you, I hate that person. <laughs> that's not, that's not right. So you don't say it, but you write it. Then I was, you know, I, I, I think like even when I began homeschooling the second time with my daughter, it was because a teacher was trying to ask me to have her stop writing in her journal because it was distracting the other kids because she, they wanted to write in their journal too. It was so ridiculous. But I was triggered by that, and I realized that from what you just said, because I knew what writing was for me, mm -hmm. and that you are asking me to disrupt or to take away my daughter's ability to develop her voice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really appreciate you sharing that and recognizing that a lot of times it's liberatory to write, and we don't necessarily share anything right. that we write. Right. Mm -hmm. So I want you all to prepare what you're gonna um, read next, and we're gonna start again with C. Thomas. Okay. But I wanna um, say to those who are watching the live. Good evening, may I have your attention please? This one is now starting to to you. The library will be closing in one hour promptly at 8 p.m. Please be prepared to exit the building at or prior to 8 p.m. please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, that was right on cue to mm -hmm. start talking, right when I was going to start talking. But I want the folks um, at home um, or who are watching that if you can um, type in the chat any of your questions, um, we're going to, after our guests, after we read a second piece, we're going to open it up for you all to ask us questions. And I'm going to ask um, our events. Let's give it up for our program and events coordinator, Molly yeah. Rufus. Yay! <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> so Molly's gonna be um, checking out the um, questions on on your end on the phone. You don't have to look at that. You can look at your phone, so it's not awkward. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And gonna tell us what's if there are any questions from people who are watching. And so this is also to give you all that are here mm -hmm. to um, to think of some questions that you may have mm -hmm. once we read our second piece. Okay. My reflection told me I'd given up on what's important. Was concerned of no sign of belief in self. Said I dreamt in sorrow, no longer in hope. Colored with hate, chasing away the true blue of my beating heart. My reflection told me I accepted being lackluster over the greatness worn to me. No sound in those beautiful brown eyes. They're used to sing songs over Captain Crunch and Saturday morning cartoons. A faded smile when greeting the sun. No shine, just a dim clicking of teeth. A low glow, radiant tone when speaking. Why have I settled? Forgotten who I am. Except the tragedy over triumph. Chris, you are a gift from God. From conception, this was spoken over you. There are prayers tucked under your eyelids. When you cry, your blessings, they shower you. You were built from the back of elders who fought so you could stand. Sacrificial war cries made to protect you. If I wish you would was a person, it would be you. You told me my name still bends with confidence. Fortress are the syllables announcing its presence. There's a flame burning behind this voice scorching the evil formed against me. My reflection said there will be no tragedy when the divine has promised life to someone they created. Do you know who you are? From where you have come? The pits of hell that tried claiming you failed. Your glow baptized fire. Don't give in when you weren't put out. Remember who you are. Black glowing joy, happy and free. Scream your name from mountaintops. You were forged in the belly of a black diamond. No stone could shimmer as brave as you. Your mama is proud. You are the fight proven rejection should fear your existence. Your pain may know you, but it has no power over you. David, your brother is proud. Now go, plant your feet, chest out, shoulders back, head held high, and smile till your shine meets the sun. Remember who you are. 
You are graceful. You are bold. You are color. You are magic. You are sound. You are hope. You are the ancestors promise. You are Marcus fifth creation C. Alexandria Bernard Thomas. Remember who you are and don't you ever, ever forget it. Burn, baby. Burn, baby. 
Burn, baby, burn. May your light never extinguish. So, so we are going to now open the floor for your questions. Any questions here? Well, I do. I want to know that that you just read, uh, "Burn, baby, burn." Now, that liberating those liberating words. What was that all about? Is that about? Um, a person who um, has not let their light so shine. What, tell me more about that poem because I could hear it, but you were moving, mm. and I would need more time to think about it. Mm. It was really good, all three of you all. But I want to hear about what that. Yes, so it's, you, you, you have hit it. Ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, um, ding. I find that. So I, I find, and I think it's. I feel like we're resonating with one another that a lot of the work that I've been writing, I'd say with, for the last seven years, mm -hmm. has really been, they've been affirmations for myself. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right? Yes. They've been affirmations for myself and re really reinforcing those things that about myself mm -hmm. that needs encouragement that yes. I think are the core foundational things about who I am, mm -hmm. but also um, is very cathartic releasing it. Mm -hmm. um, but activist prayer, I've always identified as being an activist. And I, I think yes. of an activist as someone who activates spaces. Mm -hmm. So it's really about movement. It's yes. really about action. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm also a thinker. Mm -hmm. I also, I'm definitely an organizer, but as an activist, putting those thoughts into action. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about burning, of course that's from the 60s, the term. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. But, um, and it's really not mm -hmm. in the um, toxic, destructive sense, right. <laughs> as right. much right. as it is in a lot of times we allow, um, and I think especially as we get more entrenched in um, you know, having a job in, in, in systems where we are now being viewed more that if we do anything, there is a consequence and something that um, hurts our livelihood, hurts mm -hmm. our ability to be and to live and to support and to survive mm -hmm. as individuals. Okay. So I think it's, it's going back to liberation, it's the freeing of things, right? So it may have been something in your journal that you would have never shared, right? Mm -hmm. But somebody will get up and do a poem about it and you'll be like, that's me. That, you know, then you have, I think that the, the poetry connects you to people. So you find out that you weren't alone, right, in those things. Like, your feelings weren't wrong in those things. Like, you, you're not the only one who thought these things. And you're not the only one who's experienced these things. And somebody got through it. So I don't think, I think that, um, I think that now, right, so now. So oh, I, I just think, don't care. Yeah, you don't care. You don't, you don't care. Yeah, you don't care now, right? But, but growing up, you, you wrote because you didn't have a voice. Right. But maybe you have a voice now. Right. All right. So I think that goes back to the liberation thing. Okay. Yeah. Now you're free. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, and for me, I started writing when I was 13 years old yes. to make sense of everything that I was going through as a right. child. Right. And poetry for me was the very first thing that listened. Mm -hmm. It was the first thing that heard me. It was the first thing that I was able to really pour me into. Mm -hmm. And I dare to say it was the first time I ever learned how to talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was the very first time I learned how to walk mm -hmm. and how to actually stand up for myself. It was all those things for me. Everything else was dress rehearsal until poetry came into my life. Wow. Poetry style. Beautiful. That used to be my name. <laughs> yeah, that used to be their name first. Yeah, poetry, poetry style. style. Mm -hmm. And we have a saying in the poetry community, um, writing saved our lives. Mm -hmm. And right. there's a quote that I, I know I am going to butcher it, but when I'm on, when a poet is on stage and they pull back their scars, we wound ourselves to heal everyone else. Mm -hmm. So we are then at that point at our most vulnerable. We're really screaming at the top of our pen just to make sure and just to show other people that you too have this opportunity and this place that you can get to if you only let yourself be. No matter how evasive it may be, no matter if anyone points a finger, no matter if anyone doesn't believe in you, no matter what. That's your work. That is you on paper. 
and it's your heartbeat, it's the blood flowing through your veins, it's your footstep, it's you waking up in the morning putting your foot to the floor, that is you. So, no matter if someone read it or not, good, good for them. They read it, so now they know how you felt. Then now what? Right. Now you have something else you can write about because guess what? That chapter's closed. As you already know, it's already out in the open. Let's move to the next chapter. Let's start hearing this out. Let's start doing this. Let's start making sense of that. Yeah. That's what that moment should be. That's the liberating moment right there. Okay. Well said. I just want to know, and I you guys still have complication with writer's block and do you have different techniques to get past those points to conclude your writing? I personally don't believe in writer's block. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe that when you hit that point in your life when you have when you can't write anything, there's something new inside of you that's wanting to come out, but you're not ready for it yet. Because you have to learn lessons. You have something that you have to gain in life before that piece of work comes out of you. And I'm not a fan of producing poem after poem after poem after poem after poem because that's, it, it may just be trash and are you? <laughs> and, but I mean that in a very humble kind of way because I don't, I don't look at my work as a trend. My work is a healing mechanism. It's a, it's a beacon and I don't want to kill the, the you know, you're talking about like just producing right, instead just of investing right. that, that heart investing. and spirit. Got you. And so, no, I don't believe in the writer's block. I believe in the pause that you have to take as a the person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe in the writer's block. Yeah, because I get those moments where I sometimes I think of a subject matter and then I start writing on that subject matter. But then I get that little block in there mm -hmm. and that subject goes away for a moment <laughs> and it doesn't come back to me until maybe like weeks later right. and I'm like okay this is coming back now I can connect the pieces so I think it's sort of along right along mm -hmm. that line for what you're stating mm -hmm. you stated earlier mm -hmm. can I can I also can I give you um, one of the things that I would tell um, clients when I used to do creative creativity coaching and it was always writers mm -hmm. um, is that a lot of times as writers we become very meticulous with what we want to come out. So while we're writing, we're also editing and proofing, yes. and that really yes. halts the creative yes. process. Yes. And so even as you say, you, you're writing and it's not coming, because you're probably expecting a full sentence with commas, periods, and punctuation. <laughs> what I encourage folks to do is to really look at writing as um, literally, and it's a, um, the, what is it, the artist way? By mm -hmm. Julia Cameron. Yes. Um, she, she, her, in her book, she talks about uh, my morning papers and just really doing a word vomit, just letting things come out, um, mm -hmm. you know, and not really being critical mm -hmm. on how it's coming out. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll start to see what some of the trends are. You'll, you'll start to notice what time during the day that you, you know mm -hmm. this. You're ebbing and flowing, really. And um, and looking <coughs> at your writing process is a very organic extension of who you are. So there's really no formula. How you write, what you write about, is not going to be the same about what any of us write about. And I think a lot of times we have um, this criteria or this belief that things are supposed to be neat or easy mm -hmm. or look a certain way or, or, sound, like a certain or, or sound like a certain person. And a lot of the things that we see in a polished and finished book is definitely not how it began most times. Mm -hmm. And so you have to give yourself grace in recognizing that um, if you are writing, even if, if it lacks punctuation, even if it's not really it's not clear, clear. It's right? I'm not finished. Yep. I'm finished. My yeah. daddy said that <laughs> if you have writer's book, then you need to live more mm. and read more because you have written everything that you have learned and you have written everything that you have experienced. So get out in the world and <coughs> if that does not work, I have a workshop <laughs> that I do yes, called Shameless Write Club. Like a Woman, That's right? right? So the next one is May the 6th. If you're interested, um, I take a slide scale donation. It is amazing. I love it. It is, it is amazing. This is year eight and all y'all been missing. Yes. <laughs> but look. You're at this location? No. She's going to give all of her information. Um, one of the things that I don't think it, we shared at all in our illustrious bios, we didn't um, share. Wow. 
that <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> um, all of us um, really have been, we, we do so many things, but also have been part of this really rich cultural spoken word community that exists in the DC metro area. Um, and all of us have at some point been hosts at Bus Boys and Poets. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so when we close, I would like for them to, to give those details as well as where you can learn more about the workshops that they um, present, but also where you can see them perform and continue to share mm -hmm. the art that you've witnessed today. I can perform at your house. I'm kidding. I, I, <laughs> I love it. I love it. No. no. Were there any questions online? No. Nope. Absolutely. Loves it though. What is that? Everyone loves it though. Great things are being said. Oh, oh wonderful. Oh, Fantastic. Any other questions here before we wind down? I told you this hour was going to go by quickly. Yeah. I told you. Any other questions? Did you want to hear one more piece? Or? Sure. All right. Do you all have one more piece? Yeah, You know, I came late. I need to get as much as I can. <laughs> you like, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Rejoicing, wildest dreams coming true. This smile is everlasting. This smile has a past, but is present with the future. This smile exists. Be determined, said this smile. Ain't nobody got nothing on you. Fervent is this smile. Yes, mix conti hanti work. This smile. All I see for me is better days. Shouts this smile. This smile is affirmation. And I know you love this smile, not as much as me. This smile is confident. Learn to let go. Is forgiveness, dances like no tomorrow. Freedom is this smile. This smile is important. This smile is kind. This smile is smart. Looks in the mirror and sees my mama, this smile. I'm here alive with this smile. 
I'm a survivor, fall to my knees, give thanks for this smile. Never given up this smile. Unapologetic is this smile, never turn its back, looks forward with this smile. Grateful, grateful, grateful is this smile. I cried with this smile. Became one with this smile. Stop pretending to smile with this smile. I fought for this smile. Y'all, I love this smile. For the girls who do too much. Okay. Um, okay. Who check on folks. Mm -hmm. Who hold space for others. Love easily. Express freely. Hurt harder. Fall quietly. Weep softly. May you wrap your wonder around yourself. Breathe in your beauty when others spill their attention on those less deserving. May you caress your own sensitive soul by remembering to tend to your blooming magic and always adorning your spirit with kind words and reminding your heart each day that you matter. Yes. You matter. for being with us today. What a beautiful group of people. What a beautiful, to see your beautiful faces smiling at yes. us. And we feel it. I feel it. Like, I, I feel goosebumps because I feel all the positive energy. You, you laugh. I'm for real. I feel it. I feel it. And I embrace it. Yes. And that is what poetry does for me. Like, mm -hmm. I love being in poetic spaces. And I mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking time. I know some of you are coming from work, came battling through traffic to come and be with us today, and we are so grateful that you are here. And so I would like to end with my beautiful guests to give their details so that you can stay connected yes. with us. Yes. Always stay connected with us through personwright.org. If you did not sign up for our e-letter, if you are not here because you got an email from us, then you need to see Molly before you go so that you can get on our list and stay connected. Mm -hmm. But I want you two to tell them where to get you next. Tell us about that book. New book. <laughs> and you tell us about those workshops. Yes. All right, you can follow me on IG at C. Thomas Works. That's IG at C. Thomas Works. My website is imcthomas.net. My fifth collection of poetry reclamation is scheduled to, actually it's not scheduled, it's going to be released this Friday. 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 Yes. Um, scheduled to release this, actually going to release, I keep saying scheduled, yes. it's going to release yes. this Friday. Yes. Friday. Yes. I'm going to be in here. And it is going to drop at 12 midnight like a Beyonce album. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of the book? Reclamation. Reclamation. Yes. Um, I conduct a trademark workshop of my own called Writing to Wellness, and that channels childhood trauma and to poetry. And it's discussion based. It has been. Good evening, may I have your attention, please? The time is now 7 30 p.m. The library will be closing in 30 minutes from 8 a.m. At that time, all computers will shut off, and all study rooms and meeting rooms must be vacated. That is at 7 45 p.m. Thank you. And it is um, <laughs> writing to wellness. It uses, um, it focuses on childhood trauma and how to use. If you would like a library, you can visit the area. I will be back downstairs to check out that now. All masks will be lost five minutes prior to closing. Thank you. <laughs> wellness. It uses writing to wellness, childhood trauma. Uses that trauma to turn it into poetry. It's discussion based. Um, I lead it with things that I've gone through as a child and I start out with, I'm not a therapist, I just give you the tools and experiences that my therapist and my psychiatrist have given me to navigate life. Then we talk about um, what's going on. There's two writing prompts. The first writing prompt is just a reflection from the first part. The second part, we actually read a poem catered to the theme and then we write poetry. However, there's a twist because I'm twisted. So <laughs> I introduce different forms of poetry. In this workshop, the most difficult one that I've introduced was a triptych. Mm -hmm. And what a triptych is, is a three column poem. You can read the poem in three different columns, but it has four poems in those three. So when you read each column, going across is the fourth one. Mm -hmm. 
So it's geometry and poetry, I know. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it doesn't stop there because I always give a writing prompt to make it a little bit difficult. For mm -hmm. instance, write a trip kit from the perspective of your feelings being born in water. Mm -hmm. And you have to write that trip kit in those three columns with the fourth poem going across. Mm -hmm. I've only had three students that have done that. This workshop yeah. has nice. inspired and has inspired new poets. People who have never written poetry have actually entered their poems into contests and have won. One poet actually won the Push Card Award for it. Um, another poet actually won a chapbook of the poetry that she produced within this workshop. And because of this workshop, my work that I do in child abuse prevention has gotten me recognized by the Queen and Princess of Sweden Ooh. for what I do in child abuse prevention. So this workshop wow. is powerful. Wow. So again, you can follow me at C. Thomas Works. I love that. And I do follow back. I do not believe in collecting people to follow. I don't believe in human trafficking. I think it's tax and trifling. Um, <laughs> and books come out this Friday. Reclamation dropping at 12 midnight on like Beyonce's albums do. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. 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 It's going to be on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Lulu, my website, in, in mine, in my possession, whatever you want to get it. I got you. And Writing the Wellness is held at Creative Suitland every second Monday online, every second Thursday in person conducted by me, and every last Sunday of the month on Zoom conducted by me. Is this all on your website? It is. Okay. okay. And say that one more time. The website. My website is imcthomas.net. Yes. imcthomas.net. Okay. For all of y'all in here. If you are an aspiring writer, I have an event coming up on May the 4th. It's called Authors and Appetizers. It's a Thursday night where you can ask questions. It's a panel kind of like this, but it's appetizers too. So you can you can bring yourself there and bring your friends there. Appetizers as in food. Appetizers as in food. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Authors, authors <laughs> you can so yeah, I'll that. And then, <laughs> right. and, then you can, and then you can ask, you know, the authors on how they, you know, how did they do what they did and things. Right. So if you're an aspiring writer, that's good. If you are already an author, this is a good place for you to meet other authors. That's May the 4th. On May the 6th, what I, what I was talking about earlier is Write Like a Woman. It is from ages 18 through 100. Mm -hmm. It's for every genre, every race, all y'all different, you know, whatever writers. If you want to meet other women writers, this is going to be on May the 6th from 1 to 3. Uh, both of them are at the Anthenaeum, which is also where C. Thomas book release is that they didn't tell Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and can and I reason why but, but I didn't tell you not to cut you off because we're actually sold out. We're at max. Oh, we're, oh, we're sold out? We're at max. Oh, oh, we're sold out. <laughs> so, so Nikki didn't mention that also on, what's the date? April? 27th. On April 27th, Kaniki, um, mm -hmm. Tony Medina, Rebecca Dupas, and Malik Thompson. Malik Thompson will be giving our last poetry reading of the month for Hurston Wright at the Charles Beatley Library in Virginia. Yeah. Um, oh. So there's more information. There's more information if you visit us at hurstonwright.org mm -hmm. on the remaining um, National Poetry Month events that we have. Mm -hmm. In addition to our last two classes that you can sign up for for our spring semester. Mm -hmm. um, you can learn more about me and Liberated Muse at liberatedmuse.com mm -hmm. and khadijahalicoleman.com. Um, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, for anything.